Great. Well, welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's webinar to learn more about Lakehead University, our campuses and our programs. And this evening, or I guess this afternoon, actually, we're going to be showcasing a program that is out of our Aurelia campus. Now, this information session this afternoon is primarily for students that are exploring our interdisciplinary studies program that's part of our Faculty of Social Sciences and Humanities. So we're so thankful that you've taken the time to join us this evening or this afternoon. I'm going to have to get this evening out of my brain. We do a lot of webinars in the evenings as well. And so that's uh, just me thinking that it's later in the day than it really is. So I'll try better at that. Um, so before we get started, uh, just a couple of housekeeping items I want to speak to. So please note that all of the participants except for our hosts and panelists have been muted for the presentation portion of the webinar this afternoon. Um, the answer and uh, we do want to engage with you though. So we want to have your questions posted and the answer and question section um, works really well for us during this webinar. So if you do have questions, please submit them through the Q&A function, which is located on the bottom navigational bar. Um, the Q&A function works best for us as we're able to answer the questions directly through this feature, or we can uh, answer them live as we walk through the information session this afternoon as well. Also, please be aware that many of us are still working remotely, um, and as a result, sometimes there's some unexpected and some unavoidable noises in the background. Lastly, please note that this webinar is being recorded. Uh, this does allow us to make this webinar available to individuals that were unable to attend the information session uh, this afternoon. Before we get started, we're just going to do some quick introductions. Uh, so my name is Tori White. I'm the Senior Recruitment Coordinator for Lakehead University. I am based out of the Aurelia campus, uh, but within our recruitment team, we work to promote both of our campuses and our partnership programs. Um, I love so many aspects of my job. It's uh, What I love the most is really connecting with students, providing them in, with information on Lakehead University and kind of open doors for possibilities for post-secondary. I've had the opportunity of working in the post-secondary sector for almost 20 years now and have a Lakehead graduate within my own house as well and so got to be on the parent end of things uh, previously as well. I'll turn it over to Julie. Hi everyone, my name is Julie and I'm an admissions recruitment officer at Lakehead. I'm based out of the Thunder Bay campus and I am a proud alumni of Lakehead's English program. One of my favorite parts about uh, being a Lakehead student was having the ability to chat one on one with my professors so I could just pop into their office at any point during their office hours or even outside of them and we could talk about a particularly difficult assignment or um, even just chat about life so it's really great you get to have those connections and and um, and meet one on one with your professors which um, will be quite common within the interdisciplinary studies program. Awesome so I'm just going to toss it over there to. Um, Dr. Fiddick. Hi, so uh, I'm Larry Fiddick, uh, and I am in interdisciplinary studies. Uh, that doesn't mean I have a PhD in interdisciplinary <laughs> studies. We're sort of a collection of people from different areas. So my background is uh, psychology. I have a PhD in psychology, but as an undergrad, I studied both biology and psychology. In grad school, it was a joint psychology anthropology lab which is why I feel kind of comfortable being in interdisciplinary studies. Awesome, thanks so much. So now you know a little bit more about who's on this webinar with you this evening. And before we get started, um, I wanna give you some information on what it's like to be a future Thunderwolf before we delve deeper into the interdisciplinary program. So at Lakehead, we really encourage our students and our prospective students to pursue their passion and, and step out of the crowd and do something a little bit different. And, and this can mean many different things for our students depending on what you're interested in and you know sometimes students come to post-secondary with a really clear idea and sometimes it's about exploration and our interdisciplinary program really fits well into that so we have so many stories about um, our students and our grads doing exceptional things and and as I mentioned not every student story is exactly the same so uh, there's a number of things we're really proud of at Lakehead University and one thing um, is 
is our undergraduate research. So we are Canada's number two undergraduate research university, and it's through uh, research that our students have the opportunity to work alongside with world-renowned faculty and actually become a part of creating something new and working to change the future of the industry, the future of research, and also your future as well. And Lakehead University offers undergraduate uh, research opportunities to students, and this may mean as a second, third, or fourth year student, you could be working alongside a professor being involved in research that they're doing, uh, both in, in the lab or on campus, or maybe um, at a, a external location as well. And our students and our grads really cite our small class sizes. Uh, Julie was talking about that connection with professors um, in her introduction as well. And our grads constantly cite that it's our small class sizes with 90% of our classes having fewer than 60 students in them that actually helped contribute to their sec success. And many times it was an influential professor that knew them by name and, you know, took the time to learn a little bit more about them, maybe like said, hey, there's this great opportunity to come up, I think you'd be perfect for it, that really helped them along that journey to discover themselves and, and uh, set them on their path to their future as well. And we really want to have that opportunity to connect real world experiences into our learning as well. And so Lakehead University really provides that opportunity for students to learn beyond the classroom and take that knowledge and that expertise that you're learning into the community, uh, into the lab, into the workplace. And so you're gaining those practical relevant skills that are really can position you well for the future. Couple of other things. Uh, one way that Lakehead really wants to support you is uh, through our financial package. And Lakehead University offers an unbeatable financial aid package. We're number one in Ontario uh, with over $11 million available annually to our students to help fund uh, students just like you to help fund your education. And we have a lot of diversity within our programs. We're focusing only on one program this evening, but because between our two campuses and our partnership program, we have over 65 plus programs. And it's these programs that will really help prepare you for your future with that hands on learning environment. Um, and, you know, we want to build that the, the theory uh, th that you're learning in class to those practical ends of things. And 99% of our students um, have had that opportunity to have that enhanced learning, um, learning environment by fourth year, being involved in experiential learning opportunity. And this is something we're super proud of because it allows our students to connect that in-class learning to the real world approach as well. And many times students that get exposed to this through things like co-ops, placements, practicums, internships, and working really closely with our community partners that we have um, within our, our communities that our university campuses are located in and also in a greater community as well. Our campuses are located in uh, two beautiful natural environments and we use that a lot with many of our programs. So we really step out and take advantage of that within our, within our backyard and within the interdisciplinary program. There's so much variety with the types of courses that you can get um, within this. So it's not unusual to see our students out of the classroom, outdoors, um, exploring and learning in many different ways, um, whether this is learning through communication, through teamwork, with practicing leaders, skills, um, it really allows us to bring that classroom outside of the building as well. And, uh, you know, employment is huge. So many times students come to post-secondary because they want to have that dream career or have that job um, in the future and, and coming to post-secondary, coming to university is step one to that. And you'll see that we have a 97.7% employment rate. We're higher than the provincial average for students that are employed within their industry within two years of graduation. We really prepare our students to be uh, job ready uh, from day one, which uh, many times they have employment even prior to walking across our stage at convocation. And so this is really a testament for you to know that you're going to have those opportunities to find the future and the future career that you're looking for as well. Now, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Larry to talk a little bit more about the interdisciplinary program. Hey, so um... Let's get the slide up there. There we go. So uh, what, what exactly is interdisciplinary study? So, you know, I start off by saying, well, I don't really have a PhD in interdisciplinary studies. Um, so what is it? You know, it's not a, your typical sort of discipline. Well, 
Actually, some disciplines are interdisciplinary. So like on our campus, uh, criminology is really popular. What is that about? Well, it's about crime, but you can study it from different perspectives, like uh, a psychological perspective, sociological, political, so forth. And interdisciplinary studies sort of takes this broader, that there are all sorts of um, different problems in the world, intellectual problems, social problems, so forth. And they might best be addressed with more than one discipline. So uh, interdisciplinary studies sort of looks beyond a single discipline. And the way that we do that is uh, students study two different disciplines. And at present, the ones that uh, students can choose from are anthropology, biology, criminology, English, general science, geography. Well, the list is there. So like, for example, in my case, now, I didn't study in interdisciplinary studies, but had something like this been available, I would have. So when I was an undergrad, I was both a biology and psychology major. I had a double major. And that meant that I was in school for, I forget, it was five or six years that I was in, no, six years. I was an undergrad for six years. Um, whereas, you know, in, in our program here at uh, Lakehead, you could study biology and psychology in a four-year program. Uh, you don't have to do a full double major. And uh, so, so your, your typical sort of degree, um, you know, at least half your courses are within a particular area, and then the rest are electives, and sometimes there's certain breadth requirements. In our program, we sort of split up that major into two different areas, like biology and psychology. And then running through this and sort of connecting it, we have what we call our inquiry classes. Um, there is first year inquiry, third year, and fourth year inquiry, in which you do some honors capstone project. But I'll, I'll talk about the inquiry classes as we go through the presentation. So next slide. Okay, <clears throat> so why might you choose interdisciplinary studies? It's like, well, I'm interested in psychology. Why would I, you know, take interdisciplinary studies? Well, some people don't know what they want to take. Some people, you know, they sort of think, well, okay, for instance, I come from a working class background. And when I was uh, your age, I was like, well, uh, you know, I think I should go to university to get a job. And so, uh, well, what are my options? You know, I, I can become a doctor, lawyer, or a teacher. And, um, well, I knew that there were some other things like psychology and anthropology and biology and so forth, but I'm not really too sure what you do with those. And, um, well, then I fell in love with biology, but I also fell in love with psychology. And so I, uh, you know, it meant I had to study more. But uh, the thing is, is that if you don't really know what you want to do, uh, you go, well, you know, I sort of want to study people. And it's like, I, I think that's psychology and I think that's sociology, but anthropology is sort of like that too. And so if you don't really know, then interdisciplinary studies, uh, for reasons I'll get to later, um, it's a good choice because it's flexible. It lets you sort of explore and find out what you really love and then pursue that later. And then also the real world isn't disciplinary. So I mentioned criminology. Well, crime's a problem, but crime isn't simply just, you know, its own thing. There's a bit of psychology, a bit of society, so sociology, bit of biology even. And so, uh, and, and then politics is involved. So you can bring those all together um, to help, you know, solve problems and intellectual problems, real life social problems and so forth. But what I want to talk a bit more about is um, how when you take an interdisciplinary sort of perspective, bringing different ideas from different disciplines together, you actually can have greater insight and understanding into the problem that you want to, uh, that you're trying to solve. So here's a historical example for you. So have you ever heard of Thomas Harriet? So um, I'm not actually expecting that you would, but in uh, 1609, Thomas Harriet took the newly invented telescope and he turned it towards the moon to look and see 
uh, what it was like, what the details were. And so this here is a, a, a sketch, the sketch that he drew um, of the moon. And now the thing is that um, Harriet didn't really know what he was looking at. He described the moon as being strangely spotted. And so he wasn't really able to make much sense out of these seemingly arbitrary dark spots that he observed on the moon. But uh, somebody else um, just, you know, a few months later did the exact same thing. And this was Galileo. I'm assuming that you know who Galileo is, or at least has heard of his name before. You know, you sort of know that you know somebody well when you know them on a first name basis. And uh, people know Galileo on a first name basis. So later that same year, Galileo took a telescope as well, turned it towards the moon. And this is what he drew. And now you, you might notice that these are, you know, better drawings. Now, one of the reasons why they were better is that uh, Galileo uh, had some skills as an artist. But unlike Harriet, it wasn't just that he could draw better pictures, that he knew what the pattern of light and dark meant on the moon. Um, so what Harriet had described as strange spottedness, and no, that's not a that's not a spelling mistake. That's just you know the writing at the time in the 1600s. Um, Galileo knew that it meant that the moon must have had like moons and craters on it, and this shook the Christian view of the heavens, as they were called. The moon is in the heavens with the star and the sun and that, because they thought that in the heavens everything was perfect, everything went on perfectly circular paths, and you know shouldn't really be looking at the sun, but you know, you sort of know that the sun is circular, the moon is circular. So there was this idea that uh, circles are like perfect forms and uh, the moon was, was perfect and so forth. So when Galileo looked in detail at the moon and he goes, you know what, there are all these pock marks on it. Um, that really shook their understanding of what the quote unquote heavens were like. So next slide. Now, as the uh, drawings that he, the sketches that he made suggest, Galileo knew something about art. And because he knew something about art, he knew something about what he was seeing. And he knew this in a way that Harriet didn't. So Harriet didn't study art. That's why he you know, made this sort of crappy looking sketch, whereas Galileo's were much more detailed. So one of the things that Galileo knew about was a uh, technique called chiaro scuro, which is Italian for light and dark. And this is used to depict depth. So you can see this here in this painting by Caravaggio and uh, David with the head of Goliath. Now notice the year, this was 1609, 1610, the same year, 1609, that, um, that uh, both uh, Harriet and uh, Galileo are pointing their telescopes up at the moon. Now, True, it is the case that Caravaggio was an Italian, as was, um, as was Galileo, but it went deeper than that. Galileo really did not know things about art. In fact, one of the first uh, jobs that he applied for was at the, uh, the, um, the Florence uh, Academy of Design. And design is sort of, you know, today we might think in terms of engineering, but in uh, the sort of tradition that Galileo knew, design really meant drawing. It really meant art. And there was a deep connection between art and engineering. Anyhow, so where did the painters like Caravaggio get this idea from that, that if you have this sort of light, like, like the body of David there and the head of Goliath, they look like they're coming out at you from the dark, right? And that gives you a really sort of vivid sense of depth. Well, where did they get that from? Well, where they got it from is, next slide, they got it from mathematicians. So Daniel Barbero, um, now Barbero was uh, a mathematician practicing, you know, a, a couple of decades uh, prior to Caravaggio and uh, Galileo. But uh, mathematicians at the time were interested in the play of light on objects. So, you know, one of the things that you might have um, 
studied in high school math is things like geometry, the, the sort of mathematics of 3D and 2D shapes and so forth. And the mathematicians at the time were interested in how this play, how, how like patterns of light and dark uh, are sort of predicted and, and uh, modeled uh, mathematically. And so, um, so what, you, what you have is, is that Galileo knew something about something more about astronomy because he knew something about art and Caravaggio knew something about, uh, like excelled in his art because he knew something about mathematics. So interdisciplinarity uh, really helps to solve problems in bringing different sort of schools of thought and ideas together in ways that you can't always predict. Okay, so next slide. Okay, so then suppose you want to be like Galileo. How would you go about that? Well, come and study with us. Take a, you know, study in interdisciplinary studies. And what will your degree look like? Well, again, like I said, you would choose two different disciplines. And so suppose you're interested in people and you're thinking, hmm, well, I'm interested in when people are naughty. So, you know, maybe, maybe I study criminology, but, you know, I'm not really so much into the politics of it and, you know, societal type implications. I'm, I'm interested in like psychopaths and uh, what, what makes them tick and so forth. And it's like, oh, well, you know, uh, maybe psychology is relevant to that too. Okay, so then you would take say criminology and psychology. And what you would do is in your first year, you would take uh, a full year course of criminology. And by that, I don't mean that every single course is criminology, but that, um, you know, you're taking a course in the fall and the course in the winter, and then you would take a full year of psychology, sort of equivalent. And then I mentioned our inquiry courses, and these are um, uh, focusing on problem-based learning. And uh, I can say more again about that later, but um, they're not really lecture courses per se. Um, so, um, I, I, I teach first year inquiry in human nature, which uh, draws upon things like criminology and psychology and anthropology and biology. And, and I'll give the students a, a problem that they have to work through, but I'll say more about that later. Anyhow, then in your second year, you take uh, now two full year equivalents in each of these two areas that you would choose. So again, um, criminology and psychology. Um, electives means that, you know, it's up to you, choose whatever you want, right? Whatever looks interesting to you. Third year, now you're back to uh, one full year course in each of those areas. Now it is, you know, open to you that you could in those electives, just take even more psychology and criminology. And a lot of students do that, but you know, maybe you wanna pursue a, a minor in something like anthropology or whatever. Students often use their electives for things like that. Um, then in third year, you'll see that we also have another inquiry course, and um, that will typically be on a more focused sort of topic. So uh, one of the topics that we have uh, this year is uh, fear of unknown diseases, which, you know, is sort of uh, timely with respect to COVID. Um, we've had courses on uh, documentary social justice uh, filmmaking, or while not so much the filmmaking, but you know, analyzing uh, social justice oriented films, um, environment in uh, environmental justice. So a variety of more specialized sort of topics. And then in the fourth year, again, you would be taking uh, one full year equivalent in each of your two disciplines. And you would be doing a capstone research project, which is you know, doing a thesis project, something like that. And one of the things that's a little bit different about our program in this respect is that most programs that do have something like a capstone research project are um, limited to the elite students. So in, um, in criminology, I believe students have to have a 75 or 80% average to do the capstone research project, but in uh, interdisciplinary studies, students do it as part of the requirement. So um, it's just um, baked into the degree for everybody. All right, next slide.
Okay, so um, this is where I'll say a little bit more about our inquiry courses. So they're problem-based learning. And I said, okay, well, I give students, you know, a problem and have them work through it. So I teach uh, the first year inquiry in human nature, and I'll, I'll say more about uh, human nature, social justice, so forth, when I talk about our concentrations later. But um, one of the main things that students have to work on in, in, in the course is uh, I give them a problem. And uh, this revolves around a scandal that uh, broke out in anthropology about uh, Oh, two decades ago now. And um, the president of the American Anthropological Association received an email saying that one of their members had uh, committed uh, an act of genocide. And so then I say, okay, well, you're the president. How are you going to deal with the situation? And so I leave it up to students to you know, figure out, well, what is the issue here? How are we going to deal with it? What are the possible complications? So forth. And um, so they have to put, they're told that they're going to have a press conference where they're going to have to address this scandal. Before that, they uh, put together a written press release. So the press conference is an oral presentation. The press release is a written uh, sort of summary of what they're going to say. I then take that, the press release, distribute it to the rest of the class because they're going to be journalists who are going to ask questions at the press conference. And after that, they're going to write a newspaper article on the press conference. And so I'm not lecturing on any of this. I'm uh, here's a problem. Uh, you try to figure out what the problem is as you see it. Uh, tell me how you're going to deal with it. Tell the journalists how you're going to deal with it. And then they're going to, you know, the students assess, you know, how well you deal with this in their newspaper articles and so forth. And then um, these classes are typically uh, small classes, uh, 30 students or less. Uh, the fourth year capstone, that's where you do your research projects where um, your, your prof hasn't given you a problem, but you come up with a problem of your own that you wanna to try to find a solution to. And those classes are capped at 20 students. Now, when I say they're capped at that, that doesn't mean that uh, there will be 20 students, 30 students. It means that's the most there will be. So currently in my um, first year course, we have 23 students in it. The, uh, the fourth year courses, actually, this is a little bit out of date. This year, we've capped them at 15, and, and they're sort of hovering around 50, 10 to 15 each, something like that. Um, and uh, so, so a cap is not, you know, you're necessarily going to have that many students. All right. Uh, why don't we go on to the next one then? Okay. So I had sort of said before, well, it's kind of flexible. All right. And this, this line here sort of spells out what I mean by that. So again, let's say you are uh, not really too sure. You, you, you sort of think, oh, well, you know, the social sciences are sort of interesting, but I'm not really too sure if it's criminology, political science, or sociology that I want to take. And so what this is trying to show you is that actually you don't have to, you don't have to have this planned out before you come here, right? What you can do is you can come and in your first year, you can take a year of criminology, a year of political science, a year of psychology, a year of sociology, and get a feel for them. Which ones do you actually like best before you decide, right? And then you don't even have to really decide in your uh, second year either. You could, you know, at the end of your first year, go, you know, I still really don't know what it is I want to do. So you take criminology, political science, psychology, and sociology again. And um, then in your third year, you finally go, oh, it's, it's criminology and psychology, right? And if you, you know, you probably can't remember back to, you know, the earlier uh, chart that I had on this, but see where I say uh, second year criminology, second year psychology, those um, in the original one were both elective. So you, you just bump up some of your second year psychology and criminology to the third year, and then you can, you know, uh, you're back on schedule, 
right? And you graduate in four years. Whereas a lot of programs, um, you have to take specifically this course because that leads into this other course and so forth. And so if you really haven't gotten your act together, you know, in some cases, you know, before you even come to university, but in other cases, say, by the time you finish your first year, you're looking at sticking around longer to make up for the things that you didn't take. Whereas, uh, again, this is where the flexibility comes in. We don't really say you have to specifically take this psychology course and this criminology course and so forth. We leave it up to you to choose which of those you want to take. Um, it's just a matter of taking so many um, at particular year levels and potentially shifting, say, some second year courses to the, to the third year or third year to the fourth and so forth. So long as you get it in by the time those four years are done, everything's fine. All right, so next slide. Okay, now this flexibility is something that makes our program really popular with, um, with uh, education students. So the thing is, is that, um, you know, if, if you are, you want to be a teacher, um, your bachelor degree is really just a stepping stone to get into the professional teaching program. And maybe you're not so dedicated that, you know, you want to spend all your time studying psychology. Maybe you go, well, you know, criminology is really interesting too. I would like to take that, right? Um, so we have a concurrent education option in which you would study your uh, study uh, your bachelor's and at the same time would pick up some preliminary courses in education and then you finish off with another two years in the professional program. And basically those education courses, and they are education 1050, you need to pick up a language, you need to pick up, so that would be like English, French, or uh, an indigenous language. Um, you need to pick up a science course. You would basically slot those into your, um, into your electives, okay? And um, why don't we go on to the next slide? Okay, and then, you know, can you still have that flexibility that I was mentioning? Yes, you can still do the flexibility of, you know, you don't know, is it biology, English, geography, or uh, I gotta move something here, I think it's history. Just wait, my little thing's blocking, yeah, history. Um, you, can, you can still do the same, uh, you know, sort of play the field in your first year, but if that's what you want to do, you need to choose your disciplines carefully, and uh, I would get some uh, advising from somebody like myself, the program coordinator, to make sure that you, you don't fall behind. Um, that, um, so things like um, some of the disciplines that you choose might be doing double duty. So like I said, in concurrent education, you need a year of science, you need a year of a language. Well, if one of the disciplines that you're considering is biology, that can satisfy your science requirement. If one of your disciplines is English, that can satisfy that requirement, uh, the language requirement. And so then that's where some advising would help. But, but one thing I will add here, like, why did I choose these ones? Biology, English, geography, history. That sounds like an odd mixture. Um, it is a bit of an odd mixture, but it, these sorts of combinations are popular here because when you are studying to become a teacher, they often recommend that you, uh, that you pick up what are called teachable subjects. And biology, English, geography, and history are teachable subjects. So that's why I, I picked these ones here. And now um, for the longest of time on this campus, we only had primary junior uh, teaching education. So if you're gonna teach uh, uh, you know, kindergarten, grade one, two, three, things like that. Um, and uh, now we've started intermediate senior and it's uh, particularly with intermediate senior that um, we offer, uh, sorry, where the teachables are gonna be uh, useful and 
And so the interdisciplinary studies degree um, provides the potential for picking up uh, your teachable subjects. So a teachable, um, your first teachable is typically five full year courses. That's what we require for your disciplines, five full year courses. And then um, what did I want to say about that? Uh, so, it, so it sort of maps onto what you need for a teachable. Okay, so I'm being reminded about some um, questions here. So uh, FISA has a question. If I want to study law after ed undergrad, what courses would I benefit from? Okay, so the thing is that um, there are at some places uh, pre-law programs. Um, Lakehead has a pre-law program in political science, but you should know that um, law schools don't necessarily want students studying pre-law. The thing is, is that they want to teach students law themselves. They don't want uh, non-lawyers teaching students the law. They would prefer to teach them that themselves. What they would like is that students come to law school with a wide variety of knowledge in different areas. Now, why, why do they want that and they don't want, say, all you've ever studied is law? So suppose you, are, you want to go to law school to become a trial lawyer, right? And you, so that's what you do. You, after you do your undergraduate degree, then you go to law school and to become a trial lawyer, right? And let's say that as an undergraduate, you studied pre-law. So you studied law, then you go to law school and you studied law again, right? Then you get into a trial um, where your client has been accused of murder. And the, um, the, uh, the, the prosecution has got some DNA evidence, right? And they bring in the DNA expert and they say, well, this guy's guilty because look, it's a DNA match. If you never took any biology before, you could easily be bamboozled by their expert. Like you wouldn't know, for example, that, oh, well, you know, it's a positive match, but you know, how um, were you, you know, taking proper steps against contamination of the sample and so forth? There's all sorts of things that you need to know outside the law in order to properly practice the law. And so this is why law schools like students coming in with a wide range of different knowledge because law touches on everything. And so if all you ever studied was law, then all these other things that influence the law touch upon it, you just wouldn't know about them. So interdisciplinary studies is also good for um, somebody considering going into law school. And why is that? Because again, it gives you a sort of uh, broad education in not just one thing, but in multiple things. And um, gets you, you know, puts you in the habit of coming at problems from different angles, because sometimes, you know, the saving bit of evidence will be something that you just did not expect. And you won't really see the relevance of that evidence if all you know about is law. You need to know about, you know, a wide variety of different things that you just can't anticipate. So to answer your question, though, um, I would say there is no, you know, particular combination that's particularly helpful. I would say that um, anything that you might study outside of the law is helpful. It will just mean that later um, that will influence the sort of law that you would pursue. That um, you know, maybe criminology would be helpful for criminal law, but it's not really going to be helpful for the law of contract, say, or it's not going to be um, maybe helpful in civil rights uh, law and stuff like that. Whereas maybe something like sociology or women's studies might be more helpful for something like civil rights. All right. Anyhow, so um, I had mentioned our concentrations. I had talked about this in, in, with regard to our uh, inquiry courses. The inquiry courses are focused on these four different streams that we have, human nature, 
social justice, international conflict and human rights, in environment and politics and culture. Why these ones? Well, these are the things that we're experts at here. So we, we, we focused on these ones. And um, so let me go with the human nature one. That's the one that I already suggested I'm involved in. That's um, a sort of mixture of biology, anthropology, psychology, criminology, sociology, and English. Why those areas? Well, they're all interested in a way of, you know, not just what makes us tick as humans, but what's common to all humans. What, what does it mean to be a human being as opposed to a dog, say, right? And these various disciplines all have their various ideas on what it means to be human, um, different from other species and so forth. And, uh, you know, it is the case that if, as you go from one culture to another, that people vary quite differently, but everywhere you go, people speak a language. So you might not understand their language, but they are speaking a language wherever you go. It might be the case that families differ very much from one society to another, but everywhere you go, people have families. And so the human nature concentration looks, brings together the various disciplines that are interested in things like human universals and understanding that, uh, understanding human variability as well. Uh, social justice would focus on areas like sociology, media studies, which has a very sort of, at Lake had a very uh, social justice emphasis, uh, political science and so forth that um, likewise are all uh, concerned about issues of social justice. International conflict and human rights involves things like history, where uh, military history, for example, but also um, the history of uh, genocides like the Holocaust in Germany and uh, the Rwandan uh, genocide and so forth. And environment and politics and culture is things like um, uh, the political uh, implications of the environmental movement, but also um, how this gets reflected in environmental, sorry, in, in various um, cultural things like uh, writing on the environment and so forth, like, like popular writing, like, uh, you know, um, Margaret Atwood's Kraken, I forget the name of her book, but, you know, there's been, uh, you know, uh, environmental disaster, a, a, um, a, uh, a plague and so forth, and how does this play out? So various, you know, sci-fi sort of um, books are involved, involved themes of um, environmental um, collapse and so forth. And so um, the concentrations will draw upon relevant disciplines and the particular courses that are most relevant to that. And then it bundles it together and it gives you something a little bit more focused than just picking and choosing anything arbitrarily. All right, so next slide. There was much more. Oh yeah, yeah, where do, where do our grads wind up? Okay, so you know, one of the reasons I mentioned concurrent education is that a lot of our students are in that degree program. So a lot of our students go on to become uh, teachers. Roughly half of our students are concurrent education students. Um, but then we've also had grads who go on to grad school, uh, go to law school. Some have started their own businesses or are administrators, uh, managers and other businesses that they didn't start. Um, some have gone on to various uh, health professions. So there's a wide range. I mean, we are sort of like a university within a university. And so students go on to a wide range of different jobs in the end, different careers. All right, next slide. Okay, and as I sort of suggested before, we are not necessarily, you know, have PhDs in interdisciplinary studies. In fact, none of us do. Um, in Canada, there really is only one sort of graduate interdisciplinary program that I know of. That's at Royal Roads in uh, Victoria. Um, so we're an undergraduate program. Um, that's not to say that, um, you know, interdisciplinary, that graduate studies aren't interdisciplinary. Like I said, the graduate lab that I was in 
was a joint anthropology and psychology lab. But um, often you won't find uh, a graduate program that is itself interdisciplinary, right? So anyhow, my point being that um, we come from a variety of different backgrounds in this department. I'm in psychology and other colleagues in psychology are from psychology. Um, we have a couple of people in English, a uh, couple of historians, uh, people in sociology, history, media studies, criminology. There's a wide range of different areas that we come from and our research uh, interests reflect this. So gift exchange, that's my colleague in English. I'm, my background's evolutionary psychology. Uh, historian interest in genocide, uh, political science interested uh, in global terrorism. Uh, I have to admit, I don't know who's interested in precarious work, but uh, my colleague in media studies is uh, interested in media uh, activism. Uh, another colleague in English is interested in eco-criticism. Uh, social dimensions of the mind. That's that's me and my other uh, colleague in psychology. She's also interested in psychopathy. Um, and actually, in the social dimensions of the mind, I should say, is also my colleague in sociology, uh, Ryan McVeigh. Uh, food security is a colleague in political science and globalization. I'm not too sure who that is, but there's, there's a, we come from a variety of different backgrounds. Okay, I think it's questions next, is it? Yeah. The one question I'm gonna throw out to you, Larry, which we get asked quite a bit is regarding this degree being an honors bachelor of arts and science degree, a lot of students coming in with a social science humanity background that really scares them that, uh, that it is a, and a, a Bachelor of Arts and Science. Can you talk about that a little bit? And, yeah. And how that works for our students in the interdisciplinary program? Yeah, so the thing is, is that um, it, I, I realized it's a little bit scary. It used to be even scarier to students because the thing is, is that it used to be um, we were sort of picky about the sciences that students had to take, but um, it's, it's actually, Okay, so on the one side, there's uh, humanities and social sciences, and on the other side, it's natural sciences and health and behavioral sciences. And within the health and behavioral sciences, that includes all psychology. So most, lots of people like psychology. <laughs> it's, it's often a popular major and so forth. Within our program, it's a popular discipline. So if you are interested in like English and history and you're going, oh my God, where am I going to pick up these sciences? A lot of students fall back on psychology. Um, another area that um, like if you're interested in social justice and you're in uh, the, the social sciences and so forth, um, social work uh, has a first year course where it's um, social welfare that, you know, would be, um, you know, quite relevant to somebody with an interest in social justice. Um, then there are um, geography, quite a few geography courses count towards um, the sciences criminology, some students take criminalistics, like CSI type thing, um, that's really popular. So it's not, you, you're not looking at math, physics, chemistry as your only options. Um, the, the health and behavioral sciences, which includes, uh, you know, social work and not, there's not a lot, there's not a lot of social work courses that are open to students anyhow, but, uh, but there's a lot of psychology and a lot of students pick it up through psychology. Um, a lot of students like criminology, just if you're gonna go the criminology route to getting the sciences, um, not all criminology counts towards uh, the science requirement, but there are a variety like criminalistics that do. And so I would say sort of between um, psychology and criminology, the students who are rather wary of uh, the sciences, they, they, they tend to pick up the courses in those areas. It's pretty easy to meet that science requirement without being scared about it, is really what we tell students. There's lots of options out there. And as Larry mentioned, uh, it's really not having to do those the, yeah, the, the some, traditional some of, sciences. Yeah, some of them you wouldn't expect. Like I'm pretty sure the digital photography course, uh, which is a general science course, is also 
Uh, I you know, okay, I have to look that up, but it is offered under general science, so I think it also um, counts in that. Granted, you know, photography can get kind of technical, and that's why it falls under the sciences. So, yeah, and the, as as Larry's really showcased tonight, this program is a great flexible um, program for students that are wanting to not necessarily um, study one specific area. You know, have a major and a minor. It gives so much flexibility on on having two areas from different sides as well. So you can take biology and sociology all within the same degree. There's not many programs that you can do that. So this is a, a great option for students that want to explore things that they know they're really interested in right off the get-go. Many times I talk to students and they say, these are my two disciplines. I know exactly what I'm doing in this program, but because you don't really have to declare until that third year, as long as you're smart. And we do have advisors like Larry, who's a program specific faculty advisors. And we have student central professionals as well that can assist students with some of that mapping out of your course selections. Um, there's a fair amount of flexibility and it also allows you to delve into subject areas that maybe you didn't even know you're interested in and that's the great thing about university you know take that anthropology course take that english course um things that you think are you know how that subject matter is you know is very different often in a university environment um, and lots of selections larry's mentioned even within criminology within sociology you know within philosophy there's not just one course available especially after um, the first year there's lots of options so it gives you a fair amount of flexibility and it's a great program for students that are looking at concurrent education coming into our primary junior stream but also if you're wanting to come into intermediate and senior now in, um, in Aurelia, the four teachables that we're supporting out of the Aurelia campus are history, English, geography, and a social science. It blends perfectly into our interdisciplinary program to open up even more, more doors for students of the future as well. Julie, is there any other, I know there's only been a few questions coming through and I saw that you've been answering them as we've been going through. Just wanna check and see if there's any other questions at this point. No, there was just one quick question about how you know which um, programs are offered on either campus. So I have linked, um, I'll also throw it in the chat, but there's a link to our view book and on pages 12 to 14, we list all of our program options. And if beside them they have an O, it indicates that they are available in the Aurelia campus. If they have a T beside them, that indicates that they're available in the Thunder Bay campus. So again, I'm just going to pop that here in the chat for everybody. And uh, you're welcome to order a view book to be sent to you physically as well. I've also put uh, in the chat, I put my email address. So if you have any follow-up questions on that, uh, just copy my email and uh, email direct me directly and I can answer your questions. That's great. Thanks so much, Larry. So now that we've had the opportunity to explore the interdisciplinary studies program um, and all the great features about it, let's take a look at some of the next steps and the important steps into becoming a Lakehead Thunderwolf. Important dates. So here are some of the upcoming important dates that you'll want to be aware of. The most important one here is going to be the application deadline. So if you're an Ontario high school student currently in grade 12, your application deadline is January 13th, 2022. Um, that's the one that you're going to want to take note of. So I wouldn't recommend applying the night before or anything like that. Leave, don't, don't leave it till 11.59 p.m. on January the 12th. It does take a couple of days for the information to be sent from the application center to each school that you apply to. So applying a couple of days early is always in your best interest. And then there's a couple other dates there relating to our scholarship and bursary deadlines um, and the deadline to accept an offer should you um, receive one. So how we could all go on all night about how great campus is, one of the best ways for you to experience Lakehead is ultimately to come visit us for a campus tour. I can almost guarantee that when you step foot onto our campus, you'll feel right at home and understand that it's gonna be the place where you belong. So join us virtually by booking a guided live virtual campus tour, or you can now join us for an in-person tour experience, which is available three times a week on each of our campuses. Now, today's just the start of your Lakehead journey. And if perhaps after tonight you have questions or um, still wanna learn more about our program opportunities, I encourage you to join us on December the 8th for our virtual open house. Um, we'll have 
all of our faculty and staff coming, over 110 different faculty and staff will be there to chat one-on-one -on -one with you about scholarships, admissions, programs, um, support services that we offer, everything. It's gonna be a really great experience. So um, I'll pop in the chat the link to register for the open house, um, but mark that one in your calendars as well. Still have questions, not quite sure what your next steps are, how to apply, uh, we're all here to help. So don't hesitate to book a one-on-one -on -one private meeting with a recruitment advisor like myself or Tori today, um, and we'd be happy to connect further with you. And of course, we do want you to stay connected with us. So follow us on social media to truly see what it's like to be a Lakehead Thunderwolf. Thank you so much, everyone, for taking the time out of your afternoon slash evening to explore Lakehead University. And I just wanted to take a moment to extend a huge thank you to our panelists uh, from the Faculty of Social Sciences and Humanities, Larry. Um, we really appreciate your time and uh, connecting with potential Lakehead students. So at this time, I don't see any questions in the Q&A, but uh, we will give a couple of minutes here to um, allow you to type out your questions and we will ask the panelists, the panelists live for you. Tori, are there any questions that you see right now or are we um, good to start wrapping up? I think we're good to go. Awesome. Well, thanks so much again, Larry, and for all of those of you in the audience tonight who uh, took the time out of your afternoon and evening to join us. See you soon. Okay. Bye bye.